Hello, my name is Ran, and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode, we interview inspiring movers, thinkers, and teachers on how they find their flow and much, much more. I hope you're having a great day so far. It's getting really cold down here in Melbourne, at least I think so. I'm probably not the best person to ask. Anyway, the studio renovations are coming along really well. We've got some flooring down, so we're getting near the end stages. Hopefully, we'll get some electricity in there soon and we can actually start to use it. But it's coming along really well. I'm really excited. I better get on with today's episode. This episode is a recorded conversation between myself, my wife and co-host Joe Stewart, and Lucy Kanani. Lucy has been a yoga teacher for many years, having studied at the Kripalu Center in Massachusetts, USA, and has trained with many yoga luminaries such as Michael DeManincourt, Indira and A.G. Mohan, Amy Weintraub, Leslie Kamenoff, and Richard Miller. As we'll hear in this episode, she's had many interesting occupations over her life, including teaching scuba diving, managing sales teams for radio stations, and eventually becoming the CEO of Rosian North America, a branch of a global training and consulting firm specializing in face-to-face communication. You may have noticed a constant theme in her line of work. It is that of communication, which happens to be the subject of this episode. Lucy and her co-writer Jill Danks have recently released their book, Connecting Conscious Communication for Yoga Teachers and Therapists. It's a fantastic tome on improving communication skills for yoga teachers, and as someone who can barely string three words together without intensive editing, I'm finding it incredibly informative. It's given me plenty to think about in how I present a class, and the chapters are divided up nicely so I can read a chapter and then try out what I've just learned when I'm teaching. Kay Tribe, who was on our last episode, has said that she's making it a required reading of the yoga teacher training she facilitates, so I think it's an incredibly important resource for anyone teaching yoga. And I guess on a more personal note, I feel yoga is this expansive thing, and in teaching it, we're taking from this background of philosophy, anatomy, and movement, and we need to convey all of this information in a way that's compelling and informative, but doesn't overwhelm or or take the yogi too far out of a state of mindfulness or presence. So it's really important to communicate all of this as effectively as we possibly can. Now, Lucy was extremely generous and gave us a copy of the book to give away to one lucky listener. I'll leave a link in our show notes for you to enter the competition. It's really easy. Just fill out the form and answer the question that Lucy asks near the end of the episode. Now, one note, this offer is only available to residents of Australia as we can only afford to send this off to an Australian address. We will be announcing the winner in our next episode, which will come out in a fortnight, so stay tuned for that. That is more than enough talking from me, so let's get on with this interview with Lucy. I'm a Melbourne girl. I'm the youngest of five and I was brought up in the eastern suburbs. I went to a school called Press Hill, which was in its day very progressive and did my uh, high school years there. Then I went on and studied science at Monash and I was majoring in chemistry and geology and then I became the education officer for the underwater club and I got involved in organizing all the training for the people who want to become scuba divers. I was already qualified by that stage as a scuba diver and in that process because I get kind of super involved in anything I do I went to all of the training sessions and I met all these people who were diving instructors who were also studying physical education and I started talking to them and and learning about what they were learning about and I started to think wow that really interests me a whole lot more than chemistry and geology. So I dropped out of Monash after a year and a half, much to my family's horror, and I switched across to what is now Victoria University, and my undergraduate degree is majoring, a science degree, but majoring in physical education. Oh. Yeah. And I went there because I thought I wanted to specialise in outdoor education because at that stage I was a scuba diver and a bushwalker and a cross-country skier and that sort of thing. Uh, very active, not very sporting, but very active. And I'd done ballet for about 10 years. So I sort of had some vague idea that maybe I'd take dance to people with disabilities, didn't really know what that meant, but, you know, that sort of thing. 
But during the time that I was at Footscray, I became very interested in sports psychology. So having gone sort of all pure sciences in high school and then into university, suddenly I was being in this program, being exposed to sociology and philosophy and psychology, and I found it really interesting and engaging. So I applied for and got into a master's in sports psychology, but I needed to take some time to earn some money to support myself. And I went into the commercial world and I worked as a medical rep for a pharmaceutical company for a year, which is really boring, um, <laughs> recommended. And then I was actually driving around in my car in between meeting doctors and I heard an ad on the radio to be a sales executive for a a radio station. So I applied for that job and I became a sales representative for a commercial radio station and then spent about 10 years in commercial radio and sales and then into sales management. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and oh, and I will say I lived in Melbourne and then I went with them to Sydney and then back to, to, then to Canberra and then back to Melbourne. So yeah. they do go back to an earlier part of that career trajectory. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm, I'm really interested in communication as a scuba diver instructor because I imagine you have to have this balance of like you probably can't use words because you're underwater right. and you've got to be clear with people yeah. and there's that sense of you don't want to freak people out but if there is something that people really do need to be aware of as a potential danger, you want to communicate that clearly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You had uh, shared that sort of uh, that idea of that question, and it was wonderful because it really made me think about it. And one thing that uh, Jill and I talk about in our book is that to help communication be effective, it needs to. It, to help it to be effective, it helps if people understand what you're saying. And what will help with understanding is if there is a kind of a structure to what you're saying. So in a class, it would be a clear beginning, middle and end or in a one-on-one -on -one session. But in a, any communication, there does need to also be a kind of a clear structure. And um, at its sort of very, very base, any communication requires you to prepare the person you're talking to to receive what you're going to tell them, then to deliver what you're going to tell them and then to make sure that they've received and understood it. So if you can imagine you and I are underwater and you're my student and I want to change direction, I have to get your attention. So I make sure you're looking at me. Then I give you the hand signal to say we want to go this way. And then I ask with an OK signal, have you received and understood? And you answer me with an OK signal. And that spoiled so, that whole potential <laughs> paragraph of, oh, should we go over here now? Are you feeling okay with that? Yep, I'm yeah. okay with that. Let's go into like an arm pat and a hand okay. gesture. Yeah. Well, but the other thing too is that there's sort of a parallel is that when I felt very strongly when I was a diving instructor that people were putting it's a bit dramatic, but their life in my hands. So, yeah. you know, sometimes we were diving reasonably deep, 10 to 20 metres underwater. They were new to the whole experience. And so they needed to feel safe. And I think that's the same in a yoga class and definitely mm -hmm. in a one-on-one -on -one situation. If, you, if people don't feel safe, if they don't trust you, then they're not going to open up to you and you're not going to be able to help them as their, their teacher. So as a diving instructor, I was probably on the more authoritative end than I would be as a yoga teacher. Mm. Well, I think the stakes are a bit higher. The stakes are high, mm -hmm. absolutely. So there wasn't really a question of us, people saying, oh, what, what, where might I go? Because we were a group and the group had to stay together and it was my job to shepherd people and to communicate that very clearly. So... Well, one of the reasons I asked that is because I noticed the difference in my own communication when I went from just teaching yoga on the ground to teaching aerial yoga, and I had to be yeah. a bit more of a disciplinarian as well. Yes. And usually on the mat, I would give people quite a bit of space to do their own thing, but mm. like someone could fall out and hurt themselves really seriously if they do mm. their own thing in the mm. fabric. So I'm much more on that note. We're all doing this. Yeah. You can choose this option if that doesn't suit you, but you can't just experiment and play around like this is what we're doing. I love that. Yeah, I see yeah, that. Yeah, it's, see it's that. not not necessarily been an easy transition mm -hmm. like I actually find it quite exhausting to be right. that group focus holder right. sometimes especially right. if people are a little bit distracted or yeah yeah, yeah. I guess but I hear what you're saying I haven't role. done aerial yoga but I can imagine you definitely don't want people falling out <laughs> no, <laughs> or, <laughs> sometimes as well like because I want people to feel safe as well so mm -hmm. I'll use a tone of voice that's strong but warm. Yes. But sometimes I yes. accidentally just say it how I'm feeling, like, don't do that. 
<laughs> and then afterwards I'll be like, oh, oops, I shouldn't have used that tone of voice in my head. Mm. But then I've also been thinking, well, maybe that person needed that slightly sharper tone. I would agree. To I would agree. <laughs> yep. Just to relate what you said about the, the scuba diving and, you know, once you've given them the instruction, you check that they've received the instruction. Mm. I'm just thinking maybe in, in yoga, it's not always that clear whether they've received your instruction Perhaps in one sense, if they've done the the movement that you've requested, mm-hmm. but I guess there is a possibility that they haven't actually received the instruction with the full intent. Say you'll give a general instruction to modify if you have an injury, mm-hmm. and you can't quite be sure if someone's modifying for an injury or they genuinely haven't understood mm-hmm. the next phase of the movement, mm-hmm. especially if they're doing something quite different. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I I think uh, it's a it's a it's actually an interesting point and a, and one that needs a little bit of unpacking, I mm-hmm. would say, because, you know, when we teach yoga, it's not where people should necessarily feel they have to do what mm-hmm. we're telling them to do. So, mm-hmm. so even if somebody is physically able in that particular day to move into a pose, for example, they may choose not to for a reason that mm-hmm. is not because of their physical body. For, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I don't know, a couple of a specific yeah, example. Yeah, like they're just a bit tired that day. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Or, or there may be something that they're, you know, like I have knee problems, for example. So, mm-hmm. you, you know, I modify all the time and I, I usually tell the teacher beforehand because I don't want them to feel bad that I'm ignoring mm-hmm. their, their guidance and they might therefore think I think there's something wrong with it, which is not the case. I'm just looking after my body's needs. And so that's just, say, with asana. But when you start talking about pranayama or, or meditation yeah, how can yeah. you know what yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> have you engaged your bunda i don't know <laughs> <laughs> so, so i there is this receive and understood in the sense of in scuba diving it's about personal safety in aerial mm-hmm. yoga it's about absolutely about safety i think in yoga it's hard to find the right word whether it's directive definitive but authoritative but it all that can sound all a bit too bossy mm. and telling it's more about offering but in a way that is confident so that they will be encouraged perhaps to explore something new they might not have or mm. an edge for them on that day sometimes yeah. as well there's that instruction that the the teacher will say you know a lot of times pretty much every class and then one day it will just click mm. and so I've had that experience when mm-hmm. someone will say, oh, that thing that you said today just made so much sense. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I feel like I say that every class. Right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So it's, oh, it's when they're ready to, to hear it. Yeah. The other thing, too, is that there are choices about how you teach a group class. I mean, there are some classes and, in fact, whole sort of studios where the energy is that in the classes are all very silent. But that isn't always appropriate, depends on the class. So, you know, I taught very regular class for um, a gentle yoga for healing and people in my class were there because either they had chronic health issues, they had chronic pain issues that were undiagnosed, they were recovering from injury or surgery or something like that. And I would want them to ask questions. I, I would say to them, if you don't understand something I'm saying, please ask, because mm-hmm. chances are somebody else didn't understand it as well. Absolutely. <laughs> Everyone will appreciate that clarification. Yeah. 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 And then and then you do need to manage it, though, because you don't want a whole lot of yabbering mm-hmm. either. But if you have people feel comfortable, the other thing, of course, is getting off your mat and getting out into the room and checking in with people mm-hmm. and just saying, how is that for you or... Are you comfortable with that or can I help and can I get you a block or, you know, whatever it might be. And those little interactions can be really helpful that don't interrupt or don't intrude on anybody else's practice. And there'd be some questions that people wouldn't feel like sharing with the entire group, Mm -hmm. but they would share if you were close enough that they would just ask you quietly. Yeah. So to take a little detour back to your (laughs) working life, you were this you, are you still the CEO of Rogan North America? As Rogan? Well as no. That no, that's okay. Everything that you do? No, I'm not. No, I retired. Oh, wow. <laughs> I don't, actually, I don't know if you call it that. But I joined Rogan in the early 90s here in Australia. And then I moved after a year or so to the New York office. Rogan was actually founded in the US in the 1960s and run by Peter Rogan, the founder, who's a phenomenal individual. And if 
he was a yogi, we would think of him as being a swami or a master of communication, let's just say. And he ran his own business for a while. And then in the 80s, he offered it to other people to start working with it in other countries. And a gentleman by the name of Neil Flett bought it in Australia, bought the rights for Australia, New Zealand, and then the worldwide rights. So for quite a while, Rojan was head office out of Sydney but then grew back out into the world, including New York. So um, I went there in the uh, in the early 90s and then ended up running the North American operation and we grew in New York and Chicago and Boston and uh, San Francisco and we had an office in Toronto. And also I was very lucky to travel a lot. So even though our clients were head office in the US, in New York and predominantly banking and finance clients, they would often want us to travel out and do the work in their, in their other offices. So with Rojan was a consulting firm, consulting and training firm in person-to-person communication, specifically in the corporate sector. We ran programs and did training in things like presentation skills and selling skills and negotiation skills and even telephone skills and media skills and so forth. And as the CEO, I ended up doing a lot more coaching work because I tended to work with the CEOs of all of these large firms or the, certainly the higher, the senior level people. And so I did less of the training workshops and then more of the coaching. So that was sort of part of my journey. But I will say that in all of the travel that I did and all the communication skills training and in all the different sectors of business, it's amazing to me, whatever level of seniority is people are people are people. And they all communicate fundamentally the same way. The principles still apply. And and that's what's been really exciting about bringing all this depth of knowledge and experience across into the world of yoga and observing it first and then starting to apply it and then starting to teach it. It's still just as true in the yoga world as it was in the corporate world. And so, so when did you discover yoga as a practitioner? For me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when I went to New York, I was a single person and kind of a very career-focused, driven, workaholic, perfectionist. And I loved my life in New York and I worked seven days a week and all that sort of stuff. And then in uh, 98, I met the man of my dreams and ended up, we were married within about a year and I moved out to the country or just out of New York City in a a town in Connecticut. And I started to sort of meet new people in community. And in fact, uh, one of his good friends introduced me to yoga. So it was the late 90s and she took me to a class And I started with one class a week and I was still working full time. And then I went back to four days a week and then I got pregnant and went to three days a week and, you know, and so forth. I I forgot to say my husband was a widower, so I actually inherited two children. So when I married him, I became a mother overnight of a um, a nine and a seven year old. And then we had a third child pretty quickly. So I was starting my yoga classes. Then the teacher came to our home. It started because my husband said that he would try yoga if she she would come to our home and we had space in our house. I teach people like that. Yes. <laughs> like if they come to me, I'll try I'll do it. it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that lasted for about three weeks. So we started off, I think our class started at seven on a Friday morning so he could do it before he went to work. And like I said, it lasted about three weeks. So then I started inviting other people and then I had a regular group that came, although it started a bit later in the morning. And then my teacher, Herma Hale, who is a beautiful, like an angel incarnate, as so many yoga teachers are, truly inspirational, she was for me. When I was doing two or three classes a week, she said, you know, why don't you come with me to my teacher's class? So I had the great honor of going to learn with a woman, Mary Sinclair, who had actually learned directly. Oh, I forgot to say this is all Iyengar style. Oh, yeah, yeah. And Mary had trained with Mr. Iyengar. And so I started going to her class. And so she was teaching teachers, but I wasn't a teacher in training. I was just amongst these these practitioners. And so that was wonderful. And Concurrent with all of it, so this sort of got all a bit jumbled here, but... I know so, I'm keeping up. Are you? You're yeah. 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 You're, you're, you're still mom. working, doing more yoga. Right, exactly. Then in about 2002, for family reasons, first Ramesh's mother in India, so my husband Ramesh is Indian, immigrated into the States in the 70s, so he's sort of American. His mother became unwell, and one of the best things to help a an Indian grandmother feel better is to take her youngest grandchild to show off to all of her friends. <laughs> so I traveled. Grandchildren are the best medicine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I took my not quite two year old to India and she got well and truly out of bed then and went and showed her off to all her friends. Oh, nice. <laughs> it was actually the first time I ever experienced laughing yoga mm-hmm. because she belonged to a laughing club and, and, oh. and got up and went down early in the morning to her local 
So was this Pardon. like around Mumbai or yeah, in Mumbai, like the original yeah. Laughing Club? Yeah, probably it was it, on yeah. the beach. Um, yeah, yeah, it was. It's was... on a park on the on yeah, the beach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. It's amazing. <laughs> oh, I, didn't know that. I didn't think about that. Yeah, they loved it when I bought Rebecca. So my my daughter, who as I said was uh, not quite too. They had it was really the impetus for a lot of the laughter in that particular session of the laughing yoga because <laughs> so, all outdoors and all standing up and so I went to to be with her and then I came back and then my father became unwell here and so I needed to take a bit more time off and so I decided to take six months off and during that time I really decided it was time to focus on full-time parenting of of both Beck, my youngest but my other two children as well and so I retired <laughs> I actually haven't really said that before but that is what I did and then the next eight years or so was focused fully on parenting and all my children have learning disabilities and I became fairly involved in that whole world and helped advocate for them and parents of kids with learning disabilities which is not a bad word in America that is that's the word. That's the word. Yeah, yeah, I know in Australia it's not described as that, but that's how they're described. And I became super involved in all of that. I also became quite unwell. So I had a, a bunch of health issues that for a number of years I really tried to address with complementary medical practices, alternative healing practices. And after three or four years of that, my husband, who's wonderful, said, that's great. I respect that you believe in these things, but you're not getting any better. So can we try something else so I found a really good GP who partnered with and then I got a whole lot of diagnoses and I had a whole lot of stuff wrong with me that did need some prescription drug interventions and and so forth and so over the next two years or so we got good diagnoses and then I got to the point where I would say I wasn't sick anymore which was really good. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'd been uh, pretty unwell. And yoga had sustained me through a lot of that, but it wasn't much fun. Especially since you were taking care of a lot of other I, people through that time right. as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then in 2009, an Indian friend of ours had been really talking a lot to me about doing this particular program, weekend training program, which I eventually decided to do. And in this program, they recommended that you committed what they were training was basically a, a breathing practice breathing pranayama practice and their strong recommendation was that you do it every day for 90 days without fail more or less and I did and after that three months I, I mean I would say it changed my life basically because as I said I wasn't sick anymore but I but it sounds like you were feeling great yeah it was great yeah. yeah and I became really well wow. and vibrant and had energy again and life force you know the whole thing and yeah. I thought wow maybe there's really something to yoga it's not just about going to classes and enjoying making shapes with my body and you know and and learning a little bit at that point in my yoga even though I've been practicing for so many years I didn't really know very much about pranayama and not very much about meditation other than my own sort of self-taught process and yeah so I thought I think I'd like to study and so like a lot of people I think who come to yoga teacher training it wasn't necessarily to become a teacher it really was to become to learn more about yoga and philosophy and practices and for where I was living in my life circumstances, what ended up being the best place for, for me to do my training was the Kripalu Centre, which is in southern Massachusetts. I did a 200-hour training that was two 12-day intensive blocks and I had a two- or three-month break in between. And it changed my life again in another – I mean, it was – absolutely phenomenal my teachers were incredible and their place is amazing like it has an energy about it too. it's pretty famous it's pretty yeah. famous I, I sort of had this saying a, a day at Kripalu is like a week anywhere else and a week is like a month and it is phenomenal yeah the history of the land goes way back through the Native American history and yeah it's incredible so what was interesting for me in my journey was I still after the first 12 days was like this is good I'm learning a lot about asana I'm learning about the I mean I was lucky for the anatomy and physiology because I had a phys ed degree I already kind of really knew all that which was which was helpful Um, but it was one of our pieces of homework was that we had to you know design a class and teach it and record ourselves and submit it for our assessment so me being me, I thought I'd like to practice. So what I'll do is I'll 
I sent out an email to my circle of friends and I said, you know, I'm learning to be a yoga teacher and I'd like to run some practice classes. These are three times during the week I could run a class that suit me. Let me know what suits you and then I'll pick a time. Well, everybody responded and <laughs> I ended up running three classes a week. And, Always the uh, overachiever. <laughs> did it for so for about two months I was doing about three classes a week with two to five people you know small groups and it was actually then that I totally fell in love with teaching yoga and it was this is going to sound a bit strange but it was by being really fully present and I mean of course I had a daily a very committed daily practice at that time when I was teaching I actually oftentimes would be, you know, leading things and saying things. And I think, where did that come from? Like, it wasn't really me talking. I don't know. Oh, no, I think that that makes total sense. Like, that's when it feels like it's really flowing, when it's not just the cogs whirring in your brain to make words, when it just all flows out of you. Yeah. I really felt at that point yoga was so much part of my life. It was part of who I was. And everything I teach is really about sharing what I love. You know, scuba diving was, communications was. I mean, I loved it when I was teaching with and it was my bliss and then now yoga and then now yoga and communication (laughs) and each thing is just fed into the next thing yeah Yeah, that's actually blessed one practice exercise that you wrote about in Mm -hmm. your book as a suggestion which I haven't actually done yet but Mm -hmm. I think is a great idea for teachers of all levels to video yourself teaching but then also to practice to your own video because I see myself teaching like I've had that video before and I think it's easy to get caught up in the like oh look at that face I made or be on that surface level but to actually practice to yourself and see if your instructions make sense as a practitioner, not just an observer. I think it's a great exercise and a great idea. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, it's really worthwhile doing. Another exercise actually that I do in my, uh, you know, I have a, a workshop for communication skills for teaching yoga classes is, I don't know if I want to tell you because it's a bit of a surprise when I did, but anyway, oh, no. um, I will tell you, <laughs> is that I have the students lead a class where the students are blindfolded. Oh, cool. yes. Yeah. So it, the feedback I get is it's cool doing both. <laughs> it's cool being blindfolded. It's really, yeah. I don't know if you've ever done a class blindfolded, but it's... Yes, I have. Yeah. yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's another experience. But it really puts the focus on your languaging and how clearly you're communicating. And, and of course, communication is so much more than just words. Mm. So we discuss that in our book. If, in fact, only 7% of the impact of any communication is the words, so much more of it is how it's said and then who is, is saying it which is how that's perceived is really how they're saying it. So it all comes down to the how. So not suggesting you don't want the visual, but for honing your own languaging skills. So to record yourself, but then listen to your own recording without watching any video though. And I've had blind students in my class. So to have already honed that skill of not just relying on the easy Mm. visual, just serve Mm. a really broad range of people mm. and I know that other people like to practice with their eyes closed absolutely as yes. well yes. so yeah yeah it will serve the non-visual learners yes well, I was group. actually just about to say that is the other thing is everybody learns differently and receives information and processes differently so even if you say connect with the earth through the soles of your feet and then raise your arms towards the sky some people will go like this and some people will go like this you know yeah, or when people are lying down and you say lift your arms up, some people would point to the ceiling above yes. and some people would point to the wall behind. Yeah, same thing. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So sometimes I'm asked, should you teach with your eyes open or closed? And because some you know, people respond to what they see, often much more than what they hear, if you are if you want to encourage people to practice with their eyes closed, then you would close your eyes, but then you've got to be a little sneaky and work out how to actually have your eyes open but have them look like they're closed. Start so the you meditation can with them closed to set the vibe <laughs> and then sneak them open again. Yeah. But even a little open because you've got peripheral vision mm-hmm. and everything and you can get a sense of what people are doing. You know, it's the most important thing is to have your attention on the students, not mm-hmm. on yourself. And if your eyes are closed, then you can be a little much on yourself. You know, we go off in lots of directions <laughs> there. Yeah. And so we've mentioned the book a couple of times Mm -hmm. and it really seems like accumulation of the teaching of the classes that you've done and your work in the corporate world and all of your other education and communication 
what was the process of writing the book like? Did it all just flow out easily or was it a little bit more um, rewriting and redrafting and re-strategizing and reorganizing all of that information? So the story of the book actually requires me to tell you a little bit about Jill, my writing partner. So completely amazingly and coincidentally, we both worked in commercial radio in sales and sales management at the same time against each other, although we didn't know each other. (laughs) And then she joined Rogen in Melbourne and about a year later I joined Rogen in Sydney. So we were colleagues but in different offices, so we didn't know each other well, but we worked together. Then I went to New York and then a couple of years later she went to London, so still working with Rogen. We were worldwide partners together, so we'd, you know, meet at meetings and so forth, and sometimes we'd share with, you know, client information, but we didn't know each other other than professionally. And then I retired, as I mentioned, into my family. She, too, sort of semi-retired and started doing more consulting work only. And where she focused her energy was in, she sort of transitioned from communications consulting into executive consulting, but then studied and moved into transformational Uh, sorry, not consulting, coaching, coaching, I meant to say, executive coaching, and then into transformational coaching, and then into transpersonal coaching. And so, and she did an enormous amount of study and practice in that journey. She also became a meditation teacher and studied Tantra, Tantric philosophy. And this was actually predominantly in, in Europe too. She was based in the UK and then France. And so that was her journey. And then romance, love brought her back to Australia and I had moved to Australia in January of 2011 and in about October of 2011 I was in a coffee shop in Camaray near my local yoga studio and I hear this voice and this voice said Lucy Strasser because that's my maiden name is that you? And I turned around. <laughs> and I was like, Jill Danks, is that you? <laughs> and so we were like, what? I mean, like, wow. And we had a coffee and then we had another coffee and then we had lunch and we got talking and we learned about each other's life's journey. And she became really interested in yoga. And so then she did study the diploma at the Yoga Institute and really loved it. And then she went on and studied the advanced diploma. And so the Yoga Institute is the main place that I attend teach both uh, I was teaching community classes there but that's where I teach the communication skills training and so she studied in that program and I was teaching in that program we were around each other she also became involved I was concurrent with all of this on the board of the yoga foundation which is I don't know if you've heard of that's that Michael Michael, that's right he founded it yeah, yes that's yeah. right yeah so I joined soon after I arrived in Australia I joined that board as well and Jill became involved in that so we got to know each other a little bit more there as well and then it would have been early 2015 Michael and she were in conversation one day and she was talking about coaching communication skills and he said oh that sounds interesting I wonder if that's something that maybe we could offer you know in as a workshop as a half day or a day or a weekend or whatever and would you be interested in creating and training something like that and Jill said I don't know I'll, I'll think about it so Jill went away and thought about it, which means that she wrote a 50-page document. That's how Jill thinks. <laughs> and she sent it to me and she said, this is what Michael's asked me to do. What do you think? Let me know. And I was a bit consumed at the time. There were some family health issues and things that I needed to attend to. And I said, look, I'm sorry, Jill, can't look at it. You go ahead, but I trust you implicitly, whatever. I'm sure it's great. And she said, it's okay. There's no rush. That's fine. Just when you get to it. So a couple of months later... June, July, I finally was able to read it and I read it and I thought, yeah, it's good, but it's not enough significantly different to what, because she wasn't across everything I was teaching in my three-day program for interpersonal communication skills. And so I rang her nervously to tell her that (laughs) because I respect her so much. And I said, so I've read it. And she said, don't say anything. I don't care what you think. She said, I've got an idea. And I said, what's that? And she said, how would you like to write a book together? Ah. <laughs> okay. I said, well, I actually have two first reactions. <laughs> and she said, what's that? And I said, well, my first first reaction is that for every so often in my life, I confer with a psychic-ish kind of person. And I have been told by a number of people that I was going to write a book. And, you know, each time they've told me, I'm like, okay, right, okay, what's the topic? Really, am I, you know, me? Mm -hmm. So that's interesting, number one. My second first reaction is, I'm not a writer. You know, (laughs) I can't write. And she said, that's okay, you talk and I'll write. (laughs) 
hand. And it's kind of how we began. You Fantastic. Know? So the process began with me really talking her through everything I trained in these workshops that I've designed, which was a lot of material she was very familiar with because it was steeped in the Rojan wisdom. And she captured it and so she would write it and then I would review it and rewrite parts of it and we'd sort of to and fro. So for the first nearly two years, we committed to work together every Monday for about four hours and we only wrote if we were together especially since I was talking and, and she, she was writing. writing. <laughs> so it was a, you know, it was something that we were doing, but it wasn't our primary focus. And I was busy with my teaching, my family and everything. But then by May of 2017, we got to the point where we had created what we felt was our first draft. And so we sent it off to about 10 first readers we have great colleagues here in Australia and also some in the US who were all, eight of them were teacher trainers or yoga therapist trainers. So Lee Blaschke, Janet, Michael Domenicall were three of the people who were the first readers and two professional authors read it as well, including Neil Flett. Oh, so Neil Flett, who'd been our teacher and mentor, <laughs> read it and he's written a number of books too. And we got feedback from everybody and the feedback predominantly was, this is great, this is substantial, this is worthy of continuing. We think it will be very helpful for teachers in training and teachers beyond and yoga therapists in training. However, it's too, it's too much. Too it's long. just too long. You know, there's too much in here. And so we cut it in half. So there's actually a second book that's in first draft form, sort of put to the side, which we're going to start soon now that this is published. And once that happened, so that was sort of May, June, and by this stage we'd set March this year to be our end, end game. And I will just say about writing a book is that writing a book and publishing a book are really different activities. So hearing about the process of you talking mm -hmm. and Jill writing mm -hmm. really makes sense because I was mm -hmm. just thinking about what a mental leap it must be to produce a written text about verbal communication mm -hmm. for a physical and an, and an energetic practice mm -hmm. and to make it all make yeah. sense and not be four steps removed from yeah. the yeah. actual experience. Mm. You know, the other really important part of the process was that we were writing this material and then, in effect, I was utilising it in the workshops and then observing, and I have a whole page always in my train, my own trainer manual that says notes to self, and I'm always making notes about things that worked or didn't work or I could do differently next time. So we were feeding that back into the book. So it's very circular, uh, what we were doing, and we were both doing it in our coaching practices as well. So we're both mentors and coaches, and it's a really interesting process to write with another person and yet have the book feel as if it's one voice it really does yeah, yeah it's very mm. coherent oh it does sound yeah, like a absolutely voice. Mm. Yeah, yeah 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 that was our goal so the process also was a big part of it was me talking her writing but then it shifted to taking like we'd write on an area that we felt we knew more about or or we'd say you take this topic and I'll take this topic and then we'd write and then swap and swap and swap and you have to kind of take your ego completely out of the room because you know we both want the best possible offering it's not about Jill being right or me being right and mm -hmm. you or know, who gets so, the most in the yeah, book or, yeah, 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 I mean yeah. I can't tell you who wrote what yeah yeah, right yeah, now. yeah I mean each word has been touched by both of us yeah no doubt about it yeah yeah but there's areas that she has much more experience in me and, and vice versa I guess as well there's some um, the things that feel so obvious to you that you don't necessarily communicate them in words and another yeah. person can look at that and see those gaps see yeah. those unspoken things that actually do need to be spelled out for someone else. And Jill's really, really good at that. She's really good at unpacking things and breaking them down into their micros. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. one thing that I really loved in the book, because it's so easy as anyone or as a yoga teacher to get really caught up in the stuff that you're not doing well and really beat yourself up out of that, about how there's such a focus on everyone's unique, everyone has a different voice, and really self-compassion has to be a really big part of this practice. And so there's this really beautiful section in your closing thoughts chapter. There'll always be some aspect of your communication to hone or something new to learn. There'll always be students and situations that challenge you. These will most likely be your greatest teachers. As you're practicing communication focused self-study, please also practice self-compassion as well as an appreciation for what you're doing well. Being an effective communicator requires appropriate knowledge, good skills, 
and lots of practice. It also requires a loving heart for your students and yourself. And I just really felt like that shone through the book. Like mm. it was a really Thank nurturing, you. loving tone, but also giving people some building blocks and some skills to be a better communicator. Like that's what the book's about. I'm so glad. I'm feeling a bit teary. Mm. <laughs> you, that that's what you received because that was our intention entirely. Oh. Yeah. And so yeah. were there any conscious strategies to address not just different levels of experience, but different communicators and different personality mm. types? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's it, it's in all of the teaching is appreciating that everybody is different. Yeah. yeah. So at the beginning, I said people are people are people. Yes, and everybody is different. And there's absolutely no wrong or right, good or bad, better or worse in any of those. So, for example, we talk in one area about communication styles. And yeah, that was a really interesting chapter because yeah. it's something I hadn't ever thought about. Right. Good. Yeah. So there is questionnaires in there that people can fill out and assess themselves, which is their perception of how they're perceived. But anyway. Um. (laughs) (laughs) But you do break it down into really simple questions that you can answer and then add up at the end. Oh, absolutely. So it's not yes. this abstract sense oh, of no, how no, I no. perceive other people perceiving no. me. Like there's yeah. practical questions that they're, are easy oh, to absolutely. understand. They're practical. But, but when I use that in my workshops, people say, oh, how do you want me to answer this? Do you want me to answer this as a yoga teacher or as a mother or as a managing director in my company? Or which me do you want me to answer it? Which is a great question. Mm. You know, that's a great question. Why don't you decide? <laughs> <laughs> Answer with you. <laughs> yes. If you are showing a really different side of yourself as a yoga teacher to how you mm. actually perceive yourself, what's that saying? What does that say? Right at the very beginning of the book, we have our definition of effective communication, which was originally created by Peter Rogen in the 1960s. And over all of the years of Rogen existing as an organization, Many of us tried to improve on that definition and none of us could. We were challenged in our master classes as uh, consultants. We were challenged and we never could. And then I had the great good fortune of meeting with Peter in 2016 and where I wanted to tell him about Jules and my work and kind of get his blessing for the book and also to thank him like almost like a you know, a guru would like touch his feet and, and bow to him for all that he created and all he gave to so many. So I asked him about the book and he said, I'm really happy for you to share everything that I taught you except for the definition. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, well, that's not going to work because the definition is, it's almost like everything comes back to check against the definition. Mm. A lot of people will say, well, why do you recommend that? Or why do you suggest that? And he says, well, if you go back to the definition, that's what it means to be effective as a communicator. He said, okay, let me think about it. And he closed his eyes and he thought about it and through the definition and he said, okay, I've got one change. And he, he shared with me a change. That, so after all of these years, what's that, 60 years, Finally, it was improved (laughs) by him for us, for yoga, the yoga world. And the difference was about being conscious and awake. Ah. And and so where we we really spent time deepening into me in discussion with him and then Jill and I really sat with that for a long time. What does that mean? And it's about uh, being awake is about being very present and aware of what's happening in there in the room, in the room, whether it's one-on-one or whether it's 50 students in a, in a room, it's about being aware of what's happening and so you can tailor yourself as you go along and being awake as opposed to being asleep awake, being awake awake, that line of mm-hmm. thinking. Yeah. Not autopiling as Exactly, yeah. yes, mm. yeah. But conscious is about, like, who are you? Who are you as a yoga teacher? And that's to your point about, well, if I'm asking what am I like as a whatever in the corporate world and what am I like as a, if there's a big difference, that's interesting. Like, mm. be curious about that. And so, and then the next question is, who are you on that day? And mm. that's about very much setting your intention for that session, for that class. And yeah, very much really a central important. question as a yogi as mm. well. Mm. Who yeah. am I? Yeah. yeah. And who yeah. am I in this moment? Yeah. 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 I, found, I use a phrase that I've never heard anybody else use, so I'll take it as mine, <laughs> is being in the swadhyaya of your communication. You know, because that is how you're perceived. You know, how you communicate is how you're perceived and received. Again, in the book, we talk about what makes a great yoga teacher, and I've brainstormed that and, and popcorned it from all of my groups. And, and we've shared the, a big list of descriptions of what it makes to be a great yoga teacher, and almost all of them are either communication skills or interpersonal skills. 
None of them are like super flexibility or <laughs> no, no. <laughs> being able to recite the sutras backwards. I mean, yeah, I mean that's great if you can. Sorry, <laughs> Michael Domenico can. So, yeah. <laughs> and he's a great communicator. And he's a great communicator. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's not about being super flexible exactly. Before reading your book, I just had a perception that it would be more for established teachers because if you were just starting out, then it would just be already all you could do to just keep the class going and give the mechanics of the pose but now that I've read it it seems that could actually be really great for brand new teachers as well because Mm. a lot of it is um, just clear communication strategies and kind of making good communication habits Mm. which would help so much to not have to undo some things later that were perhaps unconscious and not super helpful And Mm -hmm. also there was a whole lot in there about dealing with challenging situations. Mm -hmm. And if it hasn't come up in your teacher training and then it comes up in your class, what a great resource to go to to a book that Mm -hmm. just gives you a little bit of support Mm -hmm. and maybe some strategies. We've been really pleased with the feedback we've had from the supporters that we had who are our first readers. So people like Lee Blaschke and Michael and then my one of my teachers, Devashi Stephen Hartman in the US, and have said this should be a recommended, if not a prescribed reading for all teachers in training. We have very intentionally exactly what you said. I mean, you, it's not really a question. You've said what yes. we've done. Thank I should you. have rephrased that. That was, that was a question. Uh, well, I'm glad that, that that is how you've received it. But having said that, we also wanted it to be a companion and a resource for people in their entire journey as a yoga teacher and a yoga therapist. Mm-hmm. And we've had feedback from people who've bought the book since it's been available now in the last month or so, very experienced teachers who are coming back and saying, when I read this, it was great because it reminded me or I'd completely forgotten about this or I didn't know that. Yeah. Or, mm. yeah so and I think so sometimes so things like communication, interpersonal skills, perhaps aren't articulated, mm. if, especially in a really traditional training. The well, instructions would be passed to you the way they've yeah. just been passed down the lineage. Yes. And yes, yeah. I mean, in my 200 hour training at Kripalu, which is very conscious teaching and very heart centered and very beautiful, it was three hours, I think. I mean, in, in 200 hours, how much can you allocate to it when you've got anatomy and physiology and the philosophy mm. and all the other things you have to teach? So I, it's not a criticism, but on the other hand, it's a pretty important part mm. of being an yeah. effective yoga teacher. So this is a resource. This is why we wanted to, to create this. So I think yeah. even if you had 200 hours just on communication, you can't absorb all of it at once. Even if you did, you've got to digest yeah. it and then, yeah. you know, let it settle, which is why a book's so good because you can come back to it. Come back to it. and Yeah. And we've designed it so it feels spacious in the book itself and people can make their own notes and, and so forth. That was our intention as well. Mm. And it is a beautiful book. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yes. Yeah, <laughs> and so I've noticed a lot of the instructions in the book are really around cultivating a yoga student's own inner communication skills. So gentle cues to help them kind of tune into their own subtle awareness of mind and body. Do you want to explain a little bit about the concept of experiential words? Yoga, if you think about it, it's a personal experience, obviously, and uh, we encourage the use of experiential words to invite people to turn their focus inward so they can be with what's happening for them as they practice. And whichever of the practices, whether it's asana or pranayama or meditation, you know, it is for me and I think for many, the, the process as you journey on your yogic path is to more and more become comfortable with who you are. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but you have to pay attention to how you are to learn about who you are. And we forget, you know, mm-hmm. our mind goes off in a million, you know, a million different directions, the monkey mind. And so as a teacher, if you constantly are inviting people to be with their experience and using a variety of languaging, different words to do it, then that hopefully will help them be there and more present for their their experience if if you're talking about a class duration of class and the other thing that struck me as well uh, we just spoke to joey buick who's a trauma sensitive Mm. yoga teacher 
how jarring it can be to tell someone what their experience is in a pose mm. to be mm. something like, oh, just relax into that delicious sensation when maybe it's feeling really painful for that person. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I listened to some of what you had to say. I think I really like her. <laughs> <She's pretty laughs> I totally yeah. agree. <laughs> I totally agree with everything she's saying. Yeah, it's such a personal experience. And who, who? I mean, it doesn't. It not only who are you to tell somebody what they or even suggest what they should be feeling. It has this really potential for setting them up to, well, why aren't I feeling that? What's wrong with me? You yeah, know? am I not doing it right? Do I just need to push a bit harder? Yeah, and that's not what it's about at all. Something that did also, oh, I just found this really interesting, is you had another section on disempowering words, mm-hmm. and a lot of them really correlated with the trauma-sensitive approach, which is invitational language. Mm-hmm. And so it was using phrases like maybe or if you'd like to. Mm-hmm. And the goal for both points of view is empowering a student in their experience but I really got the sense of how using language that is a little bit too vague Mm. just is a bit confusing. Mm. So would you like to talk a little bit about finding that balance between not being coercive and not forcing someone into something with your words? A lot of it's about variety. And so that's why we offer a lot of word ideas in our book. I'd like to come to a way to start to practice with that, a suggestion. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of it's about variety because different people respond to different kinds of words. And then it's about being what we touched on earlier about being authoritative or being confident, you know, coming across as confident. So, you know, I understand the languaging, like if it feels right for, or maybe you'd like to, or you could possibly try, you know, those sorts of softer yeah, yeah. lead-ins to what you're suggesting. They're fine. They're fine. They're not, I know mm. I have them in the, dis, we have them in the disempowering section. It's if you say them all the time. And yeah. that's, that's the thing it's that we see with yoga teachers is a lot of people have some phrases that they use that are actually what we would call verbalized pauses. So they're, they're actually it would be better to have no words there at all and just a pause, either a pause to allow people to process what you've just said and then transition to what they want to do, or a pause that's even longer, which is to allow spaciousness for them to actually be in their experience. Yeah, and it is, so. it's a different, obviously in a trauma-sensitive class, there's mm-hmm. a protocol yes. in that approach. And I guess we're talking about a general class. We could still have people who are affected by trauma that you wouldn't even know about. I just want to say there, I think you're much better to assume everybody has some level Mm. of trauma. It's safer to assume. You know, I I had a class that I taught four people for five years, so I knew them really well. And so there were some things that I might say to them that I wouldn't say to a class I didn't know as well or to a bigger general class that were a bit cheeky or a bit, you know, or I might be pushing them to an edge because I'm making that judgment call. And then I see by their response that they are happy for that or pleased for it. But I think you're always better to err on the side of of caution. Absolutely. So whatever the specific training, which I haven't done trauma-sensitive yoga training, but I imagine it's appropriate for all classes. Absolutely. Mm. And so I also really loved the section on catering to a diversity of experience and some of your language suggestions around using props and alternatives to phrases like more advanced, easier or harder versions of a pose. Could you take us through some of the phrases that you suggest? So rather than say, if you'd like to push yourself today, you might use words like if you'd like to create a little more heat or travel a little closer to your edge for today, but listen to your body and see what feels right. So always with a sort of an offering and then a caveat. So uh, equally, and, and I will just say this, is that when I teach, I frequently invite people to see how gentle they can be with themselves mm. and how mm. kind. Mm. And that's actually hard for people. Yeah, that's a bigger challenge for many people. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, wow, well, nobody ever asked me to do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, people usually ask me to you know, work harder and push harder and do more. And yeah. it's the opposite. And I think often mm. as well, the ask for people to work harder and do more in a yoga class is unconscious on the part mm. of the teacher mm. because I think most teachers want their students to nurture themselves mm. and just through using something like an advanced version of the pose or the mm. full expression of the mm-hmm. pose it just mm. kind of sets up this mm. expectation that that's what you're meant to be working towards mm. well it also suggests that there is a perfect pose mm. yeah you know mm. even to say you the full expression of the pose or the perfect pose or the ultimate pose I 
That's scary. Yeah. yeah. I will say too about inviting people to be kind and gentle. And then I not only reflect on them to sort of check in and be curious about what's happening for them in their body, but also what's happening for them with their breath and in their mind. Mm. You know, where does it take them when they're asked to be gentle? Mm, it's back yeah. to that experiential. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And the multidimensionality of who we are as we are in the world. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm. What does the little voice in my head say when I'm asking to be gentle to myself? Mm. Oh, not me. I don't deserve that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, big lazy or yeah can you take us through some of the differences in communication for a one-on-one session to a group session and I've heard many teachers express that they don't really feel ready to teach a private session while they are comfortable leading a group do you think there is a different set of skills or deeper knowledge required to teach one-on-one mm-hmm. um, I do think that there are different communication skills that, that are required absolutely But having said that, when you're teaching a group class, you are still frequently having Mm one-on-one interactions with your students before or after the class, or even as you walk around within the class, you may have a significant one-on-one moment or minute with one of your students. So one-on-one communication is important if you're only a class teacher still. But what will differentiate what skills are really required will be a lot determined by the context of the one-on-one session. So in our book, we've broadly broken the context down to three kinds of one-on-one sessions. So the first one is where somebody comes to you for basically a private class. So you're the teacher, they're the student, you're guiding them, they're following what you ask them to do, more or less. Obviously, because it's only one, you're able to tailor it enormously and uh, not just whatever pose choices or pranayam choices you have, but also how you're saying it and how long you hold and all those sorts of things. But it's still sort of teacher guiding. The second one-on-one is where they're coming to you to help create a personalised practice. And so typically that can take, we can take whatever it takes because every student is different, but you would usually have two or three or four sessions. So the first session is really understanding what they're looking for in their personal practice and then maybe they'll take home something that they'll practice with, play around with, experiment with, that's my favourite word, for a week or two and then come back and meet with you again and then you start to work to co-create a practice. So that's another type of session and then the next would be say yoga therapy. And in the the latter of those two, I would say the communication skills that are, are really important are listening skills and using powerful questions and we spent a lot of time uh, both in our book and in my training we spent a lot of time in those areas and it's interesting sort of it's kind of a chicken and egg question so what's more important is it more important to have really great questions or is it more important to be a really great listener well you can have the best questions in the world but if you're not listening then (laughs) that that doesn't help but if you don't if you're not listening and the, your student, your client doesn't feel that they're being yeah, if heard you're not right and seen. asking the right questions to right, exactly. bring it out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they're they're hand in glove um, skills, and what we find is that for all of this, it begins with awareness of what you're currently doing. And what makes up all of these skills can be broken down into component parts. So, for example, with listening, we talk about the levels of listening that one can listen at. We talk about the barriers to listening or or listening blocks. And then we talk about ways of listening. So those are things to kind of know intellectually first and then to start to practice. And so we do a whole heap of exercises that help you start to practice all of those things. Then with questions, there are types of questions. So there are are questions, I mean, the most basic are open-ended and closed-ended questions. And at the most simplistic level, people say, well, closed-ended questions are bad because they just shut you down. But actually, sometimes a closed-ended question is really a useful tool because Mm -hmm. you want to get a very focused and definitive answer from somebody. So you might want to use that as a tool. And they're the basic building blocks and then follow-up questions. And then we have a couple of chapters on questions. (laughs) So you can look them all up. And they're really worth practicing with. So what I want to say before about about languaging applies for questions and listening as well. In our book, we have these active action words and then experiential words. And when I was regularly doing a lot of class teaching, once I picked a theme for my class, I would then go to my word list and think, are there words that would really 
lend themselves, suit themselves to the theme that I'm going to be teaching with. And if there were, and particularly if they were words I didn't regularly use, what I would do is write them down in a bright colour on my class notes and so I could see them or have reviewed them before I go into class and start trying to use new words in my vocabulary. Oh, and it's almost like you're setting an intention for that class as well, just with those Absolutely. words. And the, the words are in the book. Yeah, well. and the words mm-hmm. I can choose them from the book, yeah. And there's lots of theme ideas in the book as well, which we didn't even touch on. This is the same with questions as well. So, you know, if you if you set yourself a communication goal of wanting to become more effective at asking questions, given you're in relationship with people or you have an idea maybe of what's going to happen in the session, you might say to yourself, oh, I think I'm going to try this kind of questioning approach or this kind of listening approach differently. And you know, make a note of that to yourself to practice it. And we would tend to recommend that you try to practice one new thing at a time, not ten. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, then bring that into your get that into your sort of muscle memory as it were, and then go on to your next. So And so Mm. it seems like the listening is a really key skill for you. Would Mm. you recommend not a really lengthy new client form that puts a whole lot of questions in written form? Or do you think that that can Mm. be useful for, say, communicators who take Mm. a little bit more time to think about things and express Mm. more writing down than what they do in person? Mm. Great, Great question. I think both can be effective. The other aspect that's a a big difference when you get to the latter two kinds of one-on-one sessions that we were talking about is that if you don't have rapport with the person, you can have the best questions in the world and you can be a great listener, but if they don't trust you, they don't like you, they don't feel safe, they're not going to tell you the answer, to, you know, they're not going to answer the questions. Mm. So that's sort of the third hand in the hand in glove kind of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, good analogy. Well, so um, but, it's... yeah, build it, knowing it, you know, having that rapport. So that's the difference. When you have a questionnaire, you haven't typically you've either got no relationship or very little relationship. Mm. So what they're going to write on a form will, will be, you know, the really that high-level stuff. And that can be good because that can be a start of the conversation, but it's then, you know, digging down and going deeper and deeper, which is only possible when you have rapport. Mm. <laughs> so, and no one yeah. really likes filling out forms anyway. So. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I teach a class to lawyers. Mm. They are the best form filler outers. Mm. That new client form for that great. group was so helpful. Yeah, but it was I, great. Yeah, understanding your audience. I mean, and, and that's, that's the thing. I mean, it doesn't hurt to offer it if there's somebody who does like to fill out forms. <laughs> and it was really handy because it was great. a group of 20 new people and oh, they actually had quite a few different injuries mm-hmm. and different goals with that practice. So it was really good to have all of those really well-answered new mm-hmm. client forms. Just to think about how I was going to plan that class. Mm, mm. The other thing too is it's not only what people say when they answer a question, it's how they mm. answer it. And and so, you know, we talk about in, in terms of how you listen is listening with all your senses. And so you, you may ask somebody a question and they'll give you a, a short answer, but you sense somewhere either in your gut or, you know, something in their body language that there's more to it then definitely move into asking more questions, follow-up questions. You know, is there anything more? That, mm. Is there another? Is there any other aspect of that that's affected you? Has that helped you in your life or whatever it might be? Mm. Mm. And this is great for those initial listening sessions. I also mm. loved how you transitioned into the concept of the yoga conversation mm. where, especially if you do teach a lot of one-on-ones, it's quite easy to kind of chit-chat for an hour. Mm. So you had some really good, like, compassionate, I hear you phrases that then mm. just flow on into, and we're going to start the class. Mm. Do you want to take us through the concept of the yoga conversation right, and right. some of the languaging that can be helpful to kind sure. of have that balance of keep things on track but yeah. also hear the person. Yeah. So in the book we talk about a yoga conversation versus a social conversation. Yeah. And so the difference there is in the yoga conversation is you're there entirely for them. Yeah. And so a ratio I used to work with in sales is you should be listening 80% of the time and talking 20% of the time. And I think that absolutely applies here. So you need to be listening. But at the same time, there is this whole piece about who people like and people 
tend to like people they are like. So <laughs> very complicated. And so you often want to share a little bit about yourself so that they feel that you're yeah, so it's not even like personal. Them. So it's yeah. not personal, exactly. So there's a feel, a little bit of a give and take, but you just need to be very wary of the ratio of time and then be ready to redirect very, you know, appropriately so that you can be asking and learning more about as much as you can about them as a whole person. And it, it's interesting, uh, particularly in the yoga therapy communication skills training that I do, you know, we work a lot with role plays and I have trainees who will move into, so tell me about your back problem, like two minutes into the conversation and it's a 20 minute role play. You know, there can be many minutes, role plays are exaggerated in their nature, but many minutes getting to know who they are as a person and who they even are on that day, how they are in that moment, you know, is important. So uh, the biggest differentiation is, I guess, a yoga communication is it's about them. It's not about you at all. But there is a sharing quality in it as well. I guess one example from the book I loved, because sometimes people know they're there for yoga and Mm -hmm. you'll kind of say, oh, so how did your day go? And they'll Mm -hmm. launch into quite a long explanation of all the things that have gone wrong Mm -hmm. in that day and you just get the sense that maybe it's not going to serve them to continue to scroll back through everything mm. that went wrong that mm. day. So you had a beautiful phrase of something like, oh, so it sounds like you've had a tough day. Mm. Let's do some breathing and do some gentle practices. Yes, yes. And so that's what I was talking about, redirecting. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And making that judgment call when it's appropriate to intervene and say something compassionate and acknowledging where they are and now let's move into the next, let's talk about the next thing or I have another question. And depending, you might want to say, may we move on? So sometimes it's about asking permission to move on. The other thing that's worth mentioning that is, I guess, part of the rapport building is appreciating people's different communication styles. So there are people who are very direct and to the point and they will tend to give you really short answers and they're not being rude and they're not not being open. That's just how they are. And then there's people who are more analytical and very detail focused and they can't not give you lots of information because that's how they process and that's how they think. And then there's people who, are, you know, so there's these different styles. So it's appreciating that is possible. And the, popu- the human population is divided into the four different styles from all the analysis that's been done. And also appreciating your style too. So if you're with somebody who's a very different style to yours, that can be some of the most exciting part for for your development to tailor yourself to be more like them. And so if you're, for example, somebody who tends to be more direct and to the point, but you're with somebody who really likes to go on a lot, you may have to listen to yourself as you intervene because you think that you're redirecting in a nice way, but they could think that you're actually cutting them off. And how you might know that is, again, not so much what they say, but it's really you have to be totally present and aware, awake to what's happening for them. I guess it's all to have that self-awareness to kind of, I guess, take a beat Mm -hmm. before you just say those words. Absolutely. And so another interesting communication styles nuance Mm -hmm. is I do like a lot of one-on-one and really small group sessions And it's a very different feeling in my little home studio to say I'm teaching at a huge gym and one person shows up. Mm. And often that one person who shows up, like you can just tell they feel like a bit awkward and a bit self-conscious and like almost bad for being there. So how do you create an intimate energy in a big space and with someone who wasn't expecting a one-on-one session? Yeah, I have had that happen to me what I would suggest is you actually ask them what I have said is I was expecting more people here today and they're not and I have planned a class but so we have two choices we could either go with that and I'm really happy to do that or let's talk about you and see what might serve you best today how are you and then start what ends up being a kind of a a one-on-one designing a personal practice for them Mm -hmm. for that day And when you transition into it slowly like that and you give them a choice, that I found helps to to have them feel more comfortable. And I guess that's just acknowledging what's happening as well. Mm. So, well, here we are. Here we are, yeah. Yeah. I expected more, but wow, look, there, there are. The other thing you can think about too is where you position your mats. 
So you may sort of go off and be diagonally in a corner or something like that. You may sort of construct things so they don't feel... So you're not like up on the stage. stage. <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely not up on the stage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've also found as well some people feel more comfortable especially an experienced student who maybe doesn't like a lot of eyes on them who were coming for their own internal space. Sometimes mm. I'll say, do you want me to just do the practice with you mm. and we can just do it together? Mm. And mm. often people Great. Will yeah, be absolutely. more comfortable with that. Yes. And sometimes they're really glad to go, oh, okay, now I can go and do the three jobs I needed to do anyway. <laughs> I just meant maybe this class wasn't meant to happen for them. And that's cool too. A challenging part of these kind of one-on-one conversations is when there are personal or professional boundaries and scope of practice involved and kind of finding that balance between compassion for your student but also like self-care and professional responsibility for yourself. Say, for example, like a student is really going through something and they want to talk to you about it but Mm -hmm. you actually feel like it's something for a psychologist or a counsellor. It's a huge topic and obviously depending Mm. on the situation and the person but have you got Mm. any strategies navigating through situations yeah like that yeah a few suggestions yeah around that I think first of all is to recognize that there are professional boundaries and then there are personal boundaries and it's been my experience that the majority of yoga teachers are not actually aware of their professional boundaries and it's written on the Yoga Australia website there are other resources out there so I highly recommend that people know that but to some extent, even worse, most teachers have not thought about their personal boundaries. And, uh, and so we actually have a, a section in the book to encourage people to do this, to you know start by thinking about what are their personal values and what's important to them, and then how does that inform what might be their boundaries? So what are things that they are comfortable with people doing or not doing, or saying or not saying, and thinking about those boundaries? And when you get to a point where you are perhaps needing to talk about boundaries, that would sort of go under the category of what we would call challenging situations or conversations. Absolutely. Yeah. And our suggestion around that is to do it as soon as possible, <laughs> right? Usually the longer you leave it, the worse it like becomes. Like the more uncomfortable the situation exactly. is. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And depending how big the transgression is, so to speak, you may sort of manage the or or prepare the listener to receive. So we're talking about those three stages. And and so you might say, um, Joe, could we talk for a few minutes after class today? And you'd say, of course, Lucy. And uh, and I'd say, I want to talk to you about something. And I, I have to be honest, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable about it. And so you actually lead into it by acknowledging how you feel And so they're already going, oh, gosh, you feel uncomfortable. And you say, what I've noticed is, you know, X, Y, Z happens. And that's really outside my scope of practice. And I would really recommend that you see, you work with some, I'm sure there's this X, Y, Z, whatever person you think will better serve them and you make that suggestion and and I know when you spoke to Janet she talked about having professional yeah (laughs) yeah I mean I think she said it all there very beautifully when it's a personal boundary it's that's actually sometimes feels harder to say yeah definitely because Um, it's not a laid out scope of practice this is not my role as a yoga teacher this is just oh I'm feeling a bit uncomfortable with this as a person yeah it's so key what you said about well know what your own personal boundaries right. are because otherwise mm. how is anyone else going to have a clue what they are exactly mm. exactly and and often that's all you need to do is have them and then you start to you know communicate them because you have them mm. <laughs> you know yeah. you're clear about them yeah. and so yeah. people feel them I have another point about this yeah. as well mm-hmm. with personal boundaries yes. because yes running a business from your home, it's really easy to get sucked into being available for people at all times and Mm. answering that text message that arrives at like 10.30 on a Sunday night or answering emails then. Mm. And then you just set up the expectation that you're available then. You allow it to happen. Yeah, that message can wait for business hours. But if you answer it there and then, you're just inviting messages at that time. Absolutely. The other thing I want to say is that also your personal boundaries are your personal boundaries and mine are mine and they're not good or bad or right or wrong so for example particularly once you start working privately there are for example boundaries about payment 
you know, there are some people who uh, payment must be up front and if it's not in the bank account, then the session's not on. There's others where there's a sort of a tacit agreement that maybe you just pay on the day and if you haven't got enough money, don't worry about it. There's others if you don't, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So, so when you start talking about personal boundaries but then you talk about, you know, bringing in money or cancellations or those sorts of things, you really want to have thought through that. And we do have a section on that because often yoga teachers, as you mentioned, they start off with class teaching and then they transition into one-on-one. And and that can be where the wheels fall off for some people because they haven't thought through some of those kinds of logistics. Especially around yeah. things like cancellations. If it's just spelled out from the beginning, right. then it's just clear yeah. for everyone. Yeah. yeah. And those things are great to have in writing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really good. Yeah. Can you take us through some of the other communication challenges that might arise as a yoga teacher? I think it's one of the reasons why this book is such a great resource because it's often those challenging situations that make us really doubt ourselves as teachers and like wondered if we've handled them well, especially if they take us by surprise. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's no one to ask or when you're doing your teacher training, there's a teacher there, there's a whole other group of people there and I guess... If you have a mentor, that's a really helpful situation Mm -hmm. to bring to a mentor. Mm -hmm. So we would absolutely encourage every yoga teacher to have a mentor. Um, And and then they may see it may be a mentor on call kind of thing. It's not necessarily an absolutely regular. I guess it's just um, someone who you know that you can go to if one of those challenging things does happen. Right, right. There's also your peers as well. I mean, you can make a call to somebody if you ever dealt with this, what did you do, you know. And then once you start working, though, as a yoga therapist, we think you should have a supervisor so that you have much more formal and regular, uh, and that's that's very important. And we talk about the difference between being mentored and being supervised. It's kind of almost a professional responsibility that you have someone to go to so so you can have the best possible information or or answers for your students but when a challenging situation happens like in the moment typically they're because of a mismatch of some sort so maybe you've said something and they've heard it in a particular way and then there's tension of some sort and what's easy to do is to either become defensive or to be confused and just have no clue what to do. So what we always recommend, the first thing you do is you breathe. Okay, you pause. Such great yeah, yeah, advice. Great advice. <laughs> okay. And, and even to the point where, let's say, you said something to me like, Lucy, what are you talking about? Why did you say to do that? I'd say, let's take a moment. And both take a moment and say, I'm not quite clear what you're upset about. Could you just explain it to me again? So just already I've de-escalated a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. And then you would say it again. And then I might realize it's because I've said something and you've heard it differently or I've said it wrong and I misspoke. You know, that could be the reason. So breathing is always very helpful, taking time. Um, The second time that people often get into... Oh, and by the way, that sorry, that example doesn't happen very often because yoga teachers, of course, are beautiful and wonderful. (laughs) (laughs) But I think Um, that example of just asking or yes what always asking yeah yes. so breathe and ask breathe mm. and ask mm. so which is the other thing is that sometimes what yoga teachers feel are challenging situations is when they're asked a question they don't know the answer to mm. okay so it might be so Ryan, if you came to me and you said so what do you think i should do now that that you know i've post this surgery that i've had for my stomach cancer mm. and and i'm like uh-huh. I've never worked with somebody with that kind of surgery and I, you know, and I don't know anything about your diet and I don't know anything about what else you're doing in your life. You know, I'd say, that's a great question. I'd, I'd need to know a whole lot more about you. You know, so I mm. pause and then I ask a question and rather than freak out. So it's not a challenging situation. It's an opportunity yeah. to learn. I found as well, like most people who do come in with unusual medical conditions I'm more than happy to explain it to you. Yes, yes, yes. The other kinds of questions teachers feel uncomfortable with is where somebody might say, is this a religion, you know, and there's Mm. that kind of question, or, you know, what do you know about this? Or it's sort of the kind of almost like a slightly confronting kind of question. Mm. And then same thing, just you don't have to respond immediately. Or maybe like you were saying earlier, maybe that's just that direct communicator asking what they think is just an interesting question, which feels like an affront if you're... Yeah. Very, very flowery communicator. So why do you think it's a religion? Where did you hear that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and get it, yes, yeah, so that's another thing is sort of meeting like with like. That's true too. 
yeah, you don't want to be too passive and gentle. If somebody is agitated, that's not a good idea either. Say you don't have a mentor in your life. What are some good ways about going about finding one if there's just not a logical person who you see in that light? And if there is like a logical person who say your regular teacher and maybe you do want to go to them for mentoring, mm-hmm. do you just ask them, mm-hmm. will you be my mentor? Mm-hmm. Or, you know? yeah. Well, um, there are kind of different levels of mentoring, if you like. So peer mentoring would be if you rang up a friend and said, you know, what do you think? This is what happened for me. Then there's, well, many yoga training programs, you're assigned a mentor. So that might be somebody that you've established a close relationship. So you might call them and say, my training's finished, but I'd really like to keep working with you. And then you have a conversation about what the what the fees are and, and very upfront about it and everybody knows where they stand. But who's the right person for you, who's the right mentor for you can change over time. So who was right for you during your training program may not be who will best support you in the next phase. Or if you're transitioning from class teaching into one-on-one, you might want somebody who has a lot of experience in teaching one-on-one, for example. So... Um, Seeking a mentor, the Yoga Australia is putting together a mentor registry. So that would be the first place I'd recommend here in Australia is contact them and ask them for names. And they're all highly experienced teachers. And that's one option. Another would be to go to your yoga training school and ask them for the names of of other mentors and reach out to them and, and say, I'm looking for a mentor. And what is really good is if you can be really clear as a mentee what it is you're looking for. Because I've had people come to me and say, I'd love you to be my mentor. And I've had a conversation with them and I'm not the right person for them. You know, it does seem like what they're looking for is a, yeah, a different, somebody who has a different kind of experience to mine. Mm. And it seems like as well, there's people who are very much on the business side of things. Mm -hmm. And then there's other people that are more about the support Mm -hmm. and, Mm -hmm. So I, I had a I worked with a teacher who graduated had been graduated for a few years and lived in the country and had taught not sort of one class a week not a lot and wasn't didn't feel really confident as a teacher and didn't have resources around her so she reached out to me and we worked over Skype and what we found was number one we went back to a little bit about how she planned her classes so I said at the beginning it's not so much what you say it's how you say it but if you've planned what you're going to say to some extent it's much easier to say it in a more effective way (laughs) Mm, and you've got something to fall back on if the words aren't flowing Yeah. yeah you've got your structure and so we went through that and then we started talking about working with themes and for her that really built her confidence as a teacher and she was then able to go away and practice with those and then report back to me and or share it with me not report back but <laughs> share, share how that went and then ask questions and become curious and so forth so I mean there can be lots of different reasons for mentoring you mentioned about business mentoring I think that's a different that's a different subject yeah that's a different so subject. a lot of that is mm-hmm say you're on Facebook or something, Mm -hmm. a lot of those are the more prominent people because I guess that's the field that they work in. So those are the ads that you see. So, (laughs) you know, like, oh, yes, I need a mentor. This person's really great on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Like I think it's really good to kind of be clear about what you want from your mentor and, Mm -hmm. like you said, Mm -hmm. have that conversation, Mm -hmm. see if that's really what they're about. Absolutely, yeah. And then you may be really satisfied with with the support you're receiving for a period of time and then it might be time to move on to your next mentor and that would be a good conversation to have with your mentor. (laughs) Really, seriously. (laughs) Yeah. You know, if they they should be. I mean, anyone who's a yoga teacher mentor wants only the best for their mentees, you know, then they can recommend on to another person. So there's a chapter in the book about mentoring as well because that's definitely something you don't learn at teacher training. Yeah, Yeah. it's a wonderful relationship. I mean, it's probably my favourite work, yeah, is mentoring. I love the training and I love coaching and communications and so forth, but seeing teachers evolve in their teaching and always in themselves as people is just so heartwarming. Oh, it's so Mm -hmm. lovely. I'm grateful to do that work, yeah. Another chapter in the book which I think is so important and necessary is the importance of self-care. And it's another huge topic, but could you take us through some of the key points and maybe even just articulating what self-care means? Mm-hmm. 
Mm. It's absolutely critical because if you're not in a good place, in a good state of body, mind and spirit, then how can you be present, you know, which is the, the start point for, for teaching, for being a yoga teacher or a yoga therapist. So I, I think it's a sort of you owe it to your, te- to your students and your clients. And to yourself. Uh Right. And you totally owe it to yourself. I mean, particularly with all the health issues that I've been challenged with in the last many years, it's become my catch cry, which is to love and accept myself exactly as I am and to support myself in the ways that I need to be supported. And it's very different to the way you do or you do. I mean, we're all very different. And so it's a matter of becoming curious about what best supports you. And then a little bit like your own personal values, work out what is your personal self-care regime. So I have some self-care practices that would not suit another person, but they they work for me. You know, like I take 10-minute micro naps. <laughs> I took one in the library before I <laughs> Oh, you're like a napping pro if you can do it in a public place. I did, I did, I did. I, I'm a pro. I mean, I, have a, I actually work with my breath. It's probably a sort of a more of a guided internal meditation, but I think I slept. <laughs> that, well, definitely you got the benefits care. of yes, that. I did. I did. So self-care is, it can be physical, it can be mental, emotional and spiritual. I mean, my personal practice is part of my self-care and and something that, that Jill and I both believe very strongly is to be, a, you know, a truly present, effective teacher is to have a daily practice, a personal practice. And that changes over time as well. I think that yeah. can be a really interesting one because mm. sometimes say as a teacher Mm -hmm. you've had a longer or more intense physical practice and then other things change in your life and you don't have the time or the energy of that practice it's easy to feel really guilty Mm -hmm. that you're not being a good yogi when Mm -hmm. maybe the yoga that day is a yoga nidra or a meditation rather than a physical practice yeah I, i mean i would tell you that five days out of seven my personal practice is supine and, you know, whether it's body sensing, whether it's a full yoga nidra, whether it's a breath practice, but it's supine because I have so many physical challenges in my body. And that took a mentor to point that out to me. So I have a, a beautiful mentor at the moment. I'm hugely blessed. And and I was talking to him about how like, one of my issues is I have chronic migraines. And so I was talking to him about my frustration with everything being so good in my life, more or less, and yet I'm still getting these migraines. And so he was asking me about my life and about my my morning practice and about my teaching I said well you know I get up at 5 30 and then I go for a walk I do my asana on the I'm right near Sydney Harbour so I'm very blessed and then I do japa while I'm you know prayer beads as I'm I do my walk and then I come back and I, I do my pranayama and then I meditation and he was like really he said okay he said what I'd like you to do is all of that however I want you to do it in a supine position just in front of your altar and Seriously, and that's for me at the moment in my life with what I'm dealing with. Five days out of seven, my daily practice is super, <laughs> and that's self care. So it varies enormously. And I guess it also feeds into setting up those personal boundaries that you talked about earlier as well. Mm-hmm. Knowing that this is where my boundaries at means I can sort of shut out or partition off things that are outside of that and be more effective where. I need to be. Mm. Kind of saying, sense. this is my time. This is yeah. my time, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I learned that really early on. So if you remember I mentioned in the late uh, sort of 2009, I learned this practice and I did it every day for 90 days. So I created this place in our house at the time where I went to do my morning practice. And usually it was six in the morning, but sometimes it was at different times. And so I sta- and I still had relatively young kids at that stage. And so it became known that mummy was going to do her breathing practice and I didn't get want to get too woo woo with what it was so I just called it a breathing practice and they got to know that and since then I've trained my family from a very, now quite a young age for a long time that when I'm doing my practice they don't interrupt me you know they don't and so everybody's trainable <laughs> kids young kids can be then your students can be but you have to decide what you and you absolutely deserve it and should you know self-care is critical Lucy has been extremely generous to offer us a copy of her amazing book for us to give away. And we are going to just have one question that you can answer on the website. We'll have a link in the show notes that you can go and visit. But would you like to 
tell us what the question is, please, Lucy. Okay. So if I may give a context, a little context to the question. When you're acquiring a new skill or honing an existing skill, what is absolutely being shown to be the case, doesn't matter what the skill is, is people will move through levels of competency. Um, And again, we expand on this in the book. But the four levels, the first level is where you are unconsciously incompetent. And so that's when you don't know what you don't know. So that's pretty easy, comfortable. The next is when you start trying to do something. So whether it's learning to play tennis or play the flute or a new language or teach yoga, um, and you start to learn that skill, you start to realize what you don't know. And so that's when you become consciously incompetent. And there can be some discomfort with that. And that's great. That's part of the growth. Where you want to get to is to the point where you are consciously competent. So you know what to do for how long, with what force, et cetera, et cetera. Again, whatever the skill might be. And so in all the work that we do in the training and the, in the coaching is we encourage people to become conscious about what they're doing and hopefully competent about what they're doing. There is a fourth level, which is once you've practiced and you're really good at it and done it a lot, you become unconsciously competent and that's fabulous. But even when you're super competent at something, there are times you'll pick up that you may, something's not going right and you may need to come back into being consciously competent. So it's the most important level. And so part of being consciously competent as a communicator is knowing what you're doing well. So that's my question. My question is, what is one thing you do well when communicating with your students or clients? Such a good question. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because then, of course, you can repeat it and keep doing it. And it's very positive. So whether it's classes or one-on-one, that's part of being consciously and a conscious communicator. And it self-care mm. and self-compassion mm. and, <laughs> yes. like, just knowing yourself. Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. I guess there's an extra question, but you said at the beginning you'd split your book up into two. Mm. Like, how did you go about deciding what would be in the first book and what had to wait. So the other two sections that are in the the next book are, and we haven't decided the title of the book, but it's something like sharing what you know and love. So it's for yoga teachers who perhaps have been teaching a bit longer and they're ready to start uh, doing presentations. So whether they're speaking at a conference or they're going to some kind of rotary club or whatever they're talking about yoga or their type of yoga. So for different presentation situations or speeches, and then for people who want to design and run workshops. And then within workshops, we we sort of break it down into skills-based workshops, knowing doing workshops, and then more transformational workshops. And so the second book will give a lot of the same focus. It's the Mm -hmm. communication of how to do that effectively. So the planning, the organization, and then a lot around the delivery. Oh, so yeah. good, because yeah. that's definitely something you don't do in teacher training. No, mm. no, no. It's no, like no. next level. It's a more, it's more yeah. advanced. So it is, yeah, and Jill and I are both really excited about that. And I've, I've actually ran earlier this year a, a faculty training program to hone the skills of all of the teachers in the faculty of the Yoga Institute in the, both the teacher training and the yoga therapy training. And it was fun for me to experiment with some of this information, which is, again, d- deeply steeped in all the Rogan wisdom, but further developed and grown from Jill's and my experience, and, and particularly my experience in designing and running workshops, both knowing, doing, and transformational workshops. So, yeah, we're excited to start working on that. Yeah. <laughs> There's too much to do. Yeah. It's good to hear as well that you're not yeah. feeling depleted after your first book. Oh, no, energised. The yeah. importance of self-care. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. I can just give a shout-out. Can I do yeah, that? Yeah. yeah, Jill Danks is a phenomenal human being, and she, and I'm going to get teary, but, you know, I mentioned that I wrangle with chronic migraine. She could not have been more loving and supportive and honouring of my needs and my care needs. She made me be better at self-care <laughs> she made me be a better person what a, like oh, great team too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah no yeah. she really did she's a she's an exemplar of self-care yeah and yeah so no we're we're really nourished and uh That's and fantastic. excited by this so yeah so that brings mm-hmm. us on to pick of the week mm-hmm. so would you like to start joe yeah my pick of the week is a nature documentary series we've been watching on netflix called wild japan and we've been loving it firstly mm-hmm. because i didn't know how diverse japan's different ecosystems are like there's there's animals that migrated from Siberia up in the north and then there's subtropical coral reefs on other islands and it's really beautifully shot 
And we found it's a nice winding down thing to watch mm. at the end of the day for a good night's sleep. Mm-hmm. And so sort of Netflix. So right? Netflix, mm. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's cool. also Wild China, which we're just starting <laughs> on. And mm-hmm. this, this, yeah, there's a whole series from when we're done with Wild Japan. <laughs> yeah, I think all of a sudden nature documentaries is just our thing. Yeah. <laughs> My pick is it's a recent episode of the Jay Brown podcast and I really love the Jay Brown podcast mm-hmm. it's one of my favorite podcasts let alone yoga podcast and this one was his interview with Tara Styles, which I found very interesting and even at the beginning he talked about how he sort of resented her for her fame and and success, success. <laughs> and he actually you know he spoke with her about that and admitted that to her and she was actually very accepting and not surprised but she actually seemed very down to earth and just happened to have a very interesting career path that sort of went in Mm. quite a meteoric direction but I I guess I really love the way that Jay Brown teases out someone's story as someone who's trying to do a podcast himself it was was a really interesting learning experience for me and I guess it fits into that whole communication Mm -hmm. category I've got two picks I've got 17 picks I've got two Uh, Um, 15 (laughs) limits okay Okay. my first is a book which I actually listen to though so I don't know what the category it is Brené Brown's latest book Uh, I love her stuff I've loved a lot of it over the years but I think this one is a particularly excellent text so it's called braving the wilderness and do you know who she is yeah do you know yeah who I'm talking she, about? vulnerability yes that's right yeah, yeah shame yeah. vulnerability yeah yeah exactly if you google her and uh, on youtube you'll find or in ted talks that's where she mm. first sort of went viral in around 2012 talking about vulnerability and shame but she's continued to write a lot she's a social researcher and she's a, a very engaging speaker and great communicator as well But in this book, she talks about the reality of what's happening in society at the moment, um, which is pretty sad in the sense of the amount of loneliness and isolation and separateness that people are feeling. And, um, and she, you know, has a lot of background research that supports what she's saying. So it's not just a sort of an opinion piece. It's, you know, really validated. And for example, she talks about the difference between loneliness and not feeling like you belong anywhere. I found that so incredibly, you know, sad to know of it and to think about them as as separate. And I think that's where yoga is amazing because yoga classes can offer a sangha, you know, a community and have people feel that they really belong somewhere. And that's what we as yoga teachers can really offer. I mean, there's so much in the book. It's it's very, very rich. And I've got lots of ideas. I want to ring her and say, I've got some ideas of different ways. (laughs) So I'd recommend that. So Brené Brown's Braving the Wilderness. And the other is actually probably the first podcast that I ever listen to regularly, and it's called On Being with Krista Tippett. Have mm-hmm. you heard of it? It's on my subscription list. Oh, is yeah. it? Okay, yeah. you already know. No, I tell, though. Well, uh, what I love about her, she's she's an excellent interviewer, and she's a radio journalist, mm-hmm. and she came from years of radio. I, when I lived in America, I listened to, to National Public Radio and her programs and so forth, so she's she's been around a long time. She now runs her own business, I guess, called On Being with podcasts and and blogs and so forth. And what I love about it is that she interviews such a wide range of people, sort of leaders in thinking of, you know, spiritual people, poets and research. She interviewed Brené Brown. That's a good one to listen to as well. Mm -hmm. John O'Donoghue is a beautiful poet, musicians, you know, all a wide range of people. And, And what I love about it is when I'm listening, I so frequently hear the teachings of the sutras in the conversations that she's having and I'm always likening what I'm hearing as these really wise people saying things going but that's in the sutras you know that's <laughs> some of these truths are so universal so they're so mm-hmm. universal that's exactly right you know there are as many paths to union the divine whatever your you know end game is as there are people in the world and and so it's it's wonderful to hear different people talking about it in different ways and in lots of ways still saying the same thing Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so for much, Lucy. So wonderful to talk to you. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's been it's been lovely to meet you. I've been listening to you, and now I've met you face to face, and that's where real relationships happen. So. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Oh. No, we're bonded for life. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm really glad we had this conversation with Lucy. I learned a lot during this episode and I learned a lot from her book. There's a lot of stuff I've already taken into my own teaching. So I really hope this book does well. I hope a lot of people go out and buy it. And as I said at the beginning, this is probably going to be used in a lot of teacher training. So well done to both Lucy Kanani and Jill Danks on such a great achievement. Just a reminder, you can enter in our competition to win a copy. Just go to podcast.flowartist.com and you'll find a link there to enter the competition and get in the draw. We will announce the winner in our next episode, which will come out in a fortnight. And speaking of our next episode, we have a great guest it is Nicole Lee, the founder of Chi Space, and she'll tell us about how she went from working in real estate in Dubai to teaching Qigong in Melbourne. So look out for that one. Just like to say, the theme song of this podcast is Baby Robots by Ghost Soul. He is such an awesome guy for letting his users music. So please go to ghostsoul.pancamp.com and buy it. I'll see you in a fortnight. Big, big love. <laughs>